welcome back to Rome Dispatch. You know where we are because you're looking at television, you can see the set, but I truly hope that you can also hear the beautiful bells that ring every day at this time on many, many churches of Rome, religious houses, and so forth. Now, yesterday I spoke about John the 23rd, and today I'm gonna focus on Pope John Paul, soon to be Saint John Paul II. And so my guest along with me today is Andreas Widmer. Andreas was a Swiss guard for several years, is gonna tell us some wonderful stories. He now lives in Washington, D.C. You teach at the Catholic University of America, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, we're both gonna share some very wonderful personal stories about John Paul because his pontificate has been analyzed and looked at and highlights but we we want to humanize him because he was part of our lives and I have to tell you, I was in Cairo when John Paul was elected. I was working, helping out someone at the New York Times there, and the name came over the uh, BBC radio that we didn't have any television coverage, and it was, uh, my friends looked at me and they said, who, what Italian cardinal is Wojty? And I said, I have no idea. Then we hear them say that this Polish cardinal has, has been elected. Well. He'd been Pope for about seven years before I met him for the first time, and it's a good thing this meeting was not a sign of things to come. I had been in Rome 12 years. I was going to move back to America. And a couple nights before my departure, the Pope's secretary called, and he asked if I could be in the square the next morning at 6.30 to go upstairs and attend Mass in the Pope's private chapel. Uh, you just don't get asked that very often. So Mass was amazing, wondrous. The Pope is six feet from you presiding at Mass. And afterwards, about 20 of us went into a library, and you're kind of in a, in a semicircle. And I had decided the night before, a sleepless one, that I would speak English to John Paul. I had no idea how much time we had. So his secretary comes around, introduces me as the young lady from the press office. And the next thing you know, I am saying to the Pope in my Shakespearean English, Your Holiness, I'm ending my life in Rome. And the Pope grabbed my hand, you can see it in this picture. He grabbed my hand, he leaned in, and he said, what, Cosa? And I realized what that sounded like to someone whose native language was not English. I just said, I'm ending my life. So I quickly explained the whole thing in Italian, and I actually have a nice picture of both of us smiling. So that was my very first meeting, and I'm sure Andreas will have a, a, a similar story. And then just other highlights I've drawn from an enormous album of photos that I must say I'm delighted to have of meetings with the Pope. Um, Christmas of 1993, I was asked to be a lector at the Papal Mass, the Christmas Mass in St. Peter's Basilica. And then in 1996, he met, uh, there we are, at the Mass, being a reader. 1996, he met a delegation from, uh, uh, coming back from Istanbul at a conference. And then the next photo um, shows actually, after the one of the delegation, the last time I met the Pope. And it was December 14th. 2004, he met all of us from the press office to celebrate Navarro Valls' 20 years as director, and I learned Polish that day, how to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and the Pope, I was told afterwards, was very moved by that. So lots and lots of stories, lots of privileges. I was part of four Vatican delegations, and the Pope spoke to us on all of those occasions. And before I go to Andreas for his stories, too, I would just like to share with you one video, because a number of us might have pictures with a Holy Father, but this is a video from him meeting the delegation in August of 1995, before we all flew to Beijing. And I think you'll be able to hear the conversation, the Pope talking to me, California. and I'm answering, here we go. I brought now, the sunshine. All Americans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a great power. <laughs> We're going to do a great job. God bless. Thank you for your prayers and your mass. And your family also. Thank you. 
many, many, many privileged stories like that. And I know Andreas has the same number of stories in his several years here in, in Rome. And we did a radio interview once, Andreas, and I was very moved, and I am today as we speak, by your story of your first Christmas as a very young Swiss guard yeah. and John Paul. Tell us about that. So I, I was a Swiss guard from 86 to 88. And you know, the Swiss Guard is a foreign legion, uh, so <clears throat> it's Swiss people serving here in the Vatican as a, in a foreign country. So you, you actually have to give up Swiss passport to come here and serve. And I, you know, I grew up in a somewhat secular environment in Switzerland. And, and uh, when I found out that one could be a bodyguard, I just thought that was about the coolest thing you could do. So sure. I signed up. And the fact that you had to protect the Pope was something I didn't have anything against but I, I wasn't doing this for any religious reasons. I didn't mind it, but it, I certainly didn't come here for religious reasons. I came here because I thought being a bodyguard was a really cool thing. So against all odds, they accept me. I go through all the tests and everything. And, and uh, so in late 86, I arrive here and I get to the gates and, and I start my recruit school. Now the deal with the recruit school is if you, if you pass certain tests, uh, you're free until service begins on January 1st. And I, <clears throat> I remember I finished that about um, December 23rd and, um, and then thought for the next seven days I'm going to have a great time and get to know Rome and everything. And um, I get up that morning and I go downstairs and the sergeant major sees me and says, hey, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm going to enjoy uh, Christmas here and uh, see Rome. And he says, no, you're not. You, I, somebody got ill. You, I need you to go on duty. And I said, no, 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 you get this wrong. I start on January 1st. This is the military. They say, what? <laughs> you want to challenge me? So he made me go on duty that night. And I was really, this, this just started a really bad day for me. Uh, that morning, the 24th. Away from home and family. Uh, I was, the uh, first time that I ever really left Switzerland uh, or, or my village. I come from a village with 400 people in it. More cows than people, I like to say. And um, I'm the youngest of six kids. We're a very close-knit family. and. So I come to Rome, I didn't understand a word of, uh, of Italian, didn't speak English at all. Um, and I come to Rome really as a kid. And here, the first thing I experience from these people, these, you know, the new superiors, is that they violate my agreement and make me go to work. That afternoon then, this was in 86, we had one telephone in the barracks, in the Swiss Guard barracks, and I call back, call back home. And my father picked, and, and you know, there was one phone, so there was always a line. My dad picks up and I tell him, uh, you know, that I, I wish him a Merry Christmas and so on. And he says, great, you go celebrate Christmas tonight. And, and I said, I don't. Well, I'll I be have on to, duty. I have to work. And it, I just, to him even, I couldn't really say it with a straight face. And then my mother got on the phone. And, and I'm her baby. <laughs> I'm the youngest of six. She cried right out when, when, I, when she heard this. And I, of course, had to, the only time in my life I had to hang up on her because I would have cried and there's 30 military guys right behind me waiting in line. But you ended up having an amazing story <clears throat> to tell them. I, I ended up leaving and going upstairs and it's, it was the worst night of my life. I, I went upstairs, it's actually the window right behind us where the papal upstairs apartment is. Upstairs meaning the papal apartment. The papal apartment and I, that night I was the, the last guard before the Pope. It's a small little room and that suited me. It was a very dark, a, 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 a lightly lit room I was in there and I, w I had what you would call uh, my, my emotional uh, perfect storm. I accused myself, you're coming here, uh, you don't know what you're doing and, and these people don't even care about you, you don't speak a language, you don't have a friend here. And I cried. And then the radio goes off and the commander says, uh, you, you know, the Pope is going to celebrate Christmas Mass and he's going to leave with, uh, through your exit, let him out. And the door opens. And I go and I turn the key and, the, and step back and the door opens and there's John Paul like with this, I, I can remember this, this beautiful light flooding into my little dark room and, and he stands there in the doorway and he, but he had this habit that when he was interested in, in something, he would tilt his head. And he tilted his head and he pointed at me and says, you're new, what's your name? I've never seen you. And I tell him my name and he comes close, stretches out his hand and our hands meet and then he looks up and he notices my red eyes because sure. I've been crying out there. And he didn't ask any questions. He just, he just immediately knew no. and, and, and looked at me and says, 
Of course, this is your first Christmas away from home, isn't it? Wow. Tears. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to be his bodyguard. Right. Tears started to come down and he pulled me in and held me tight on, with, with my elbow and said, you know, Andreas, I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for the sacrifice you're making. Wow. I really care about what you're doing here. I'm going to celebrate Mass now. I'm going to pray for you. Well, you know, Andreas, that, what affected me about the story was the utter total humanity. You were now actually looking at a father and a son, almost, in, in that moment. And if you could put that in a larger framework of what a Swiss guard, his being present for caring for the Holy Father, absolutely protecting his life, how has that changed a lot of you? Did, did some of you go in as tepid Christians and come out soldiers of Christ? Many of us Swiss guards go, not with a negative attitude for the church, because you wouldn't, then you wouldn't do this, but with, with a tepidness, mm -hmm. uh, that we're more interested in the security aspects than the religious aspect, and then you meet the Holy Father. And, and I remember that as I started to see this man, John Paul II, and I saw how he lived, and not only what he said, but primarily how he lived and how he treated us, that at some point I started to say, whatever this guy has, that's what I want. Yeah. And he would talk with us and say, what I have, you can have. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you can have that. Exactly. And I thought, okay, how? And he would start to tell us to pray and how to pray and, and, uh, and how to approach life and, and how, to, how Christianity, how our faith is this, is this great opportunity to grow as a person that we were made for excellence and that he wanted us to, to fulfill that excellence. And he would point at the saints and say, look at these people, if they can do it, you can do it. And now tomorrow we can look at him and say, if he can do it, we can do it. I, I don't know about you, but one of the things that most impresses me, and I've been asked a thousand times in recent days, is the fact that thinking of saints for, has been for us in the past, till we came mm -hmm. here, thinking of saints has been St. Dominic, St. Francis, St. Anthony. They've been gone for a millennia yeah. or hundreds of years. All of a sudden, men, too, in my life, John the 23rd, the first pope I ever saw, and then of course John Paul. Two people we knew, they were yeah. flesh and blood, yeah. we shook their yeah. hands. And now they're gonna become saints that we can emulate. Yeah. It's when I had first communion, I received a little holy card with St. Francis on it. And it was always my favorite holy card. But you see, St. Francis was almost like a, a fairy tale to me. Sure. Because I couldn't relate to it, to him. And I think one of the effects and changes that John Paul made is he provided us with the new saints. So as of tomorrow, I have a new favorite holy card. And this one isn't a fairy sure. tale, neither, the, neither was St. Francis, but it's somebody we can relate to because all of us, everybody who's watching it, this has seen this man right. and knows him. And, and that's one of the aspects that this was a man that we all met. And even you see this on TV now, when you, the, there was a presence, even through, even through the media, there was a presence that he had. Whenever I met this man as a, as a guard, and you know, we're supposed to be the people in the background. Every time he turned to me and he talked with me, I felt that I was the reason he got up that morning. And wow. he did that to everybody. And that's why out, there were 10 in my class, one of them, uh, and none of them were really practicing. One of them is a priest today. Oh. And the rest, I would say, out of the 10, eight others are strongly practicing Catholics today in Switzerland, based on their experience with John Paul. And that is so important. And what you said about just being close to him as you and I were close or could shake the hand on, on those occasions. I think even people in a square or the Paul VI Hall at a papal audience, they, they felt something about that presence. And I was asked earlier today how I would summarize John Paul's pontificate. Well, we're looking at uh, 26 mm -hmm. and a half years. Mm -hmm. We're looking at dozens and dozens of firsts, yeah. the first pope to do X, Y, Z, and I wrote a list years ago for the Vatican about that. But the he still managed, whoever the person or the group was, to convey something very special to that individual. So you could be part of 20,000 in St. Peter's Square. For the two hours of a general audience, he was your pope. Mm -hmm. He was your, he your man. He spoke to you. Mm -hmm. He spoke to you. One of the great things that I saw, and, and what I love about this Pope is that when he knew that I admired him, and being secular, I admired him and he could have, you know, today in our culture, we take this. He didn't. 
he, he pointed on and, and pointed to the cross and says, you know, what you're looking for is Jesus Christ, not me. In a way, that's exactly what saints do, right? And Andreas, that's what we're supposed to do in our daily what, life. And so, anybody so Joan who gets, with the media, yeah. you uh, uh, right now as a teacher and yeah. so forth, we're all supposed <clears throat> to point people to Christ in our I lives. Think very early on in his pontificate, it, became, it was very apparent for this. Wasn't it a French journalist who wrote back, who, who sent a wire back after he met John Paul for the first time early on, who said, this, this is not a pope from Poland, this is a pope from Galilee. And oh, I think how this beautiful. Is, I think this is, for me, this is the summary of John Paul's pontificate, that I think really this is, a, this is somebody who emulated Christ and imitated Christ and brought Christ to us. I, I heard him once say that when he prays, he doesn't, his, his one favor he asks of God is to please see the world how he sees it. The reason why I think he saw me in my crisis, you know, you're 20 and you now, I can say now, well, this was a kid who was sad, he wasn't with his mom. But you know, at 20, th this was a, a but existential it was real at crisis 20. for me. It was me. real. Mm -hmm. He noticed that because he prayed so much that God gave him the gift because he was begging for it, to see others like God sees them. And God saw my, my grief and my, my self-doubt and my insecurity. And because, because John Paul prays for this insight, he saw this, and this is what we can all do, is to stop praying for something for me, but to say, Lord, help me see the world like you see it, and then be your instrument of healing. Oh, and his prayer life, do we even have to tell our viewers who've watched him at Mass, just totally, he'll lean against his crozier, totally absorbed in the liturgy. And Andreas, I always had a feeling if he was going to meet different people, he'd go from you to Joan to whomever, between you and that next person he was praying. It's like prayer never left who he was. But you know, also, let's look back for a minute. Look at John, the two new saints mm -hmm. that will make popes 81 and 82, by the way. Up till today, mm -hmm. there are 80 canonized popes. So 82 as of Sunday. But um, you look at John the 23rd, you look at John Paul, you look at Francis today, whom John's uh, secretary called Francis the successor of John the 23rd. But the importance of the prayer life, the importance of Jesus in our lives, we have to aim, that's our goal. Jesus in our lives, his great love, God's, Jesus's great love for us and mercy. We, we saw mercy, we have Divine Mercy mm -hmm. Sunday, tomorrow. I think this sainthood is all about divine mercy. Yes, yeah. it, it, well it has to be because God made us, we're weak humans, mm -hmm. we're weak uh, because of Adam and Eve, but we also have our failings because we have free choice. Yeah. Yeah. And with our free choice, we can choose to yeah. do good or, or, or bad. And um, so, oh, I wish we had a, an hour long show but we don't, but thank you so much for those memories. And we'll, we'll do this again. We'll see each other a lot. We'll, we'll be in DC, but we're gonna take just a slight pause right now and come back with some of our own friars. So, right. Andreas, Thanks thank you. Me, John. God Thanks bless you. you. Mm. Watch over us, John Paul. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the next part of Rome Dispatch. We just had Andreas Widmer, a former Swiss guard, with some amazing insights and stories about his time with John Paul. And now, I don't think the gentlemen to my left need any introduction, but I'll say their names anyway. So we have Fathers Joseph, John Paul, Mark, and Dominic. And I do wish we had about another hour, but we have a John Paul and I think maybe you want to give us a reflection on your namesake, soon to be saint. And that's where you're heading to, right, sainthood? <laughs> Do you have about two hours? Yes, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, um, well, I guess I just want to talk about just briefly about World Youth Day. John Paul II sure. um, is really uh, famous for gathering young people. And um, it's just amazing. I, I've been part of, uh, I went to World Youth Day in Toronto. And he was really frail there, but there was something about him and his voice that resonated with me. Uh, I was just in a seminary at the time. I was still discerning and kind of like discerning uh, joining these guys. And I heard him speak at the last mass and he was talking about uh, be not afraid, have courage to follow Christ in the religious life. And 
there was probably a million people at that mass, but it was everybody around me, all the young people, like almost disappeared. And I thought that he was talking to me. And it, it just had that personal, like, it, t it spoke to my heart. And I, you know, I broke down. And oh. there was this lady next to me who put her hand on my shoulder and said, you must be a seminarian. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. You know? But in the youth days you were at, didn't you discover a lot of young people saying that to you? Yeah, yeah. He was speaking, the popes yeah. are speaking to me as a person. Yeah, a personal touch. A yeah. personal touch. Yeah, and a young heart. He may have been old in body, but eternally young in, in heart. And that's what, to be a saint is to, is to have that um, just well, he a, once a living said to youth. Be with young people, heart. you have to be young. Or they yeah. make you young. I can yes. say that for myself. So, um, Father Mark, what kind of reflections or memories or particular well, moment? Along, along those lines, too, is World Youth Day gatherings. You know, they would ask him, why do you appeal to the young people so much? He says that Holy Spirit that draws people to the church. And, uh, and that's one thing that always impressed me so much is travels. He would just revitalize areas that he would go into and just bring the gospel, preaching the gospel. And for me personally, I was always moved by his, his uh, obviously deep interior life. Yeah. He just had a depth to him. You could just tell, even seeing him on a stage far away, that there was just something so solid about him in every way. And personally, as a priest, I mean, just inspiring. He's just, just totally committed to that vocation. Just yeah. everything in his life was about that. You, you wanted for John Paul to write the word prayer all in capital letters. Mm. Yeah. because that's who he was, the fiber of his being, and he transmitted it to right, us, didn't he? Right. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and what's a favorite moment or memory or reflection of yours? You know, what really especially strikes me about him was his devotion to the Holy Eucharist, that it was said even as a bishop in Krakow that his kneeler was more like a desk because he loved to do his work there, and he said that that's where he got his inspirations especially and his handlers on his many pilgrimages that he made, if he found a chapel where the Blessed Sacrament was, he threw the schedule off because he would go in there and he would spend time wow. in adoration. He had that kind of love and devotion to the Eucharist. And also in his predia in, in the chapel here in Rome, um, I suppose wherever he was, he had little prayer petitions, letters were brought to him, he would read them, so and so in Iowa asking for prayers for a sick relative or something, and, and then there would just be long lists that um, his secretary would, would compose. So. And he would really take those to heart too, and he would yes. really bring oh, yeah. them into his prayer. Yes. yes. And in the back row here. <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, we always talk about his spiritual legacy and the way he's affected the lives of countless millions. But one of the things we don't often think about is that this man was a, a workhorse, an academic workhorse, that he took the, the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, unpacked them, and then gave the church many documents that are used for the day-to-day -day operation of the internal workings of the Catholic Church including the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which he said was really the last document of the Second Vatican Council, the Code of Canon Law, which John the Twenty-Third called for when he called for the Second Vatican Council as well. So th those things uh, together with the spiritual plus all the academic and the internal life workings of the church, this man, I think many people want to call him the Great. Oh, I, absolutely. I think it just comes to our lips automatically. Mm -hmm. And then I think someday when we read his name in textbooks, it, it will be followed by, by great. And you know, w one of the untold things, and this is where, of course, we need another half hour, but uh, some of the untold stories, or anyway, unpublished, concern miracles that he performed while, that occurred while living. When a saint is created and they start the cause, however, um, the congregation only looks at miracles after they have, uh, after they have died, because you're supposed to ask through the intercession. Of, I don't know if any of you have heard any stories of either after or before. Do you have one? Um, it was uh, before he died. Um, during the nine days of mourning, one of the cardinals gave a homily, and he talked about how John Paul II visited him as Pope when he was in the hospital, and he had some kind of throat cancer. And the Pope went in and um, he said, you know, he massaged his throat, you know, and started praying with him. and he said you're going to be fine left it at that he was cured 
And, and again, th these are these stories that the congregation can't take, nobody denies no. either. Because yeah. I know Cardinal Ozziewicz told me one of a Polish family that came with their eight or nine or 10 year old son who'd been blind from birth, mass in the Pope's sure. chapel, they meet him afterwards, and the Pope had blessed him mm -hmm. crossing, his, I don't know if he touched the eyes, I don't remember that part. So the family leaves, they're walking across St. Peter's Square, and the little boy says, Mom, that's the most beautiful fountain I've ever seen. And her mom is like, I beg your pardon? Uh, and, and he could see. And they went to a nearby phone and phoned uh, then Monsignor uh, Stanislaw and, and said, you have to know this. And so there's plenty of witnesses to that. And um, obviously we have one of the miraculous cures here with us this weekend. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Divine Mercy Sunday, I'm sure, is very special for all of you. And just your thought on Divine yeah. Mercy Sunday. And the fact that he passed into eternity on the eve of Divine Mercy Sunday, and it was also the first Saturday because he had such a devotion to Our Lady. And that was really what he proclaimed, wasn't it? To have no fear, right. to trust in the Lord's mercy. At his funeral mass, they added uh, St. Faustina to the litany of the saints. Right. And, uh, well, so it'll yes. be very, very special for us. And I don't know where this half hour is gone. I know we have like 10 seconds left. <laughs> so anyway, it has been a marvelous time. It's always marvelous seeing you in Rome and seeing you at home. I hope to be there in a few months. So God bless everybody following us. And uh, we're going to pray for your intentions tomorrow at Mass. We've received a lot of requests. and. Even ones we haven't received. We know you want prayers said. We will do that to our two new wonderful saints, John the 23rd and John Paul. And thank you so much for joining us here these days, these very special days in Rome. God bless.